Good morning. It's good to be here. It's been a long time. I was thinking that it's been almost 25 years since the first time I preached here. Um, a lot has happened in those years. Um, and it's, it's just so lovely to be home again. Um, I like to think that Mike and Harry would be proud. I hope that you will still like me after this sermon is finished. <laughs> it's a tough one, and we're going to work through some truths uh, that are neither comfortable nor particularly welcome. I invite you to keep your hearts and minds open, to try to listen to words that may not at first seem like good news. I promise there is good news. But as you listen to this sermon, you are welcome to close your eyes or take a walk or leave the sanctuary altogether if it is too much too soon. We are having a conversation about Indigenous peoples and our relationships to their communities. This is important and essential work, but it is not easy work. That said, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to God who has prepared us for the work of reconciliation. I wonder if you ever read a choose your own adventure book or read them to your children or your grandchildren. In those books, you make a choice at every stage of the story about what direction you're going to go. I think Jesus would have liked to choose your own adventure books because his parables are like that sometimes. As Jesus tells stories, we who are listening are invited to make a choice about how we would behave if we were characters in the story. The parable of the Good Samaritan is just such a story. As we listen, we can see ourselves in the story. And we are compelled to make a choice about our own behavior. We know this story. A man beaten in a ditch a stranger who cares for him, and an important lesson that our neighbors are not limited to those we know and love. But let's take this familiar story and change it up a bit. Somewhere in Canada, you are out for a walk on a beautiful evening and you catch movement out of the corner of your eye, and you see that there is someone lying in the ditch. As you come closer, you can see the blood and the bruising. And although she is moving, she is barely breathing. This is an indigenous woman. You have a choice. Do you engage or do you walk away? Unlike the priest and the Levite in the story who didn't stop, I like to think that I would stop. But my history as a Canadian calls that choice into question. Because for generations, Canadians have walked by bruised indigenous people, leaving them to suffer. In Jesus' story, the priest and the Levite had their reasons for not stopping, although we don't know what those reasons are. They might have been busy or tired. Perhaps they did not want to dirty their hands in a way that would interfere with their liturgical responsibilities. Perhaps, and this is the most likely as far as I'm concerned, they simply didn't have the resources to help. They didn't know what to do. So they kept going.
You and I also have our reasons for not stopping to help this indigenous woman. There are stereotypes and biases, and we might believe that this indigenous woman got herself into her own mess, maybe because of drugs or alcohol, maybe because she is lazy and hasn't taken care of herself, maybe because she's different than we are, although we can't quite define what that difference is. But she is a stranger, and maybe we believe that our resources should be kept for those we know and love. Maybe we are reluctant to help because we believe that she should pull herself up by her bootstraps. Maybe we don't stop because there is a whole history of colonial reality that stands between us and this woman. For generations, we have been taught implicitly and explicitly that indigenous people are lesser than white people less worthy of help and support. We have been taught that the indigenous languages and rituals and ceremonies are not quite appropriate, not quite civilized. After all, our churches participated with the government of Canada in a project that removed children from their homes and families and communities and sent them to be educated like white people. We might not stop because we are ashamed. Maybe we are ashamed of the way that white people have treated indigenous people. We might not stop because we believe it is someone else's responsibility to care for the indigenous community. We were not there. We were not there when children were stolen from their homes. We were not there when indigenous peoples were being annihilated. We were not there, so what responsibility is it of ours? We might not stop because this woman is simply not a priority for us. We are busy with our homes and our families, and our relationships with indigenous peoples fall somewhere near the bottom of a long list of responsibilities. For some of you who are immigrants to Canada, you might not know the history and you might not have any sense of how this relates to you. We might not stop, and I think this is the main reason, we might not stop because we simply don't know how to help. We don't feel that we have the training or the resources to support this woman who is going to need more than just medical treatment. She will need healing in other ways. Because quite apart from her current state of affairs, she has been harmed by intergenerational trauma that threatens to overwhelm indigenous communities. So while you and I are here debating, wondering who is my neighbor, she is still lying by the side of the road. She is still lying there as we have a conversation about whether we want to help and whether we are able to help. We realize all of a sudden that the situation is urgent. There is no time to debate history. There is no time to deny responsibility. There is only enough time to tell the truth that needs to be told and to make a choice. I'm endlessly fascinated by the men in Jesus' parable who just keep walking. You and I are not like those men, the priest and the Levite. We're not like the Samaritan man either, 
although he is forever in our good esteem. Because even though he was likely a merchant, a foreigner, and thus not bound by the laws of Israel, he stopped to help without asking questions. This was surprising to those who were listening to Jesus because merchants were hated. They were perceived to be ungodly, selfish, getting rich at the expense of poor communities. And yet this merchant did what the holy men could not. Maybe because he wasn't weighed down by history or religious commitment. We are not like the men in the story because we are followers of Jesus Christ. Which means we engage in this story as people with particular faith commitments. Not only are we compelled by love to stop and help, We are compelled by love to tend her wounds. And not only to help and tend wounds, but to befriend her. To accompany her on a journey of healing. We have this ministry of reconciliation, says Paul in 2 Corinthians. What does it mean to be reconciled? The most important part is that God has already reconciled to us, forgiven us and freed us for the kind of relationship and accompaniment we are talking about here today. Reconciliation is not about going back to the way things were, because Settler folks have never had a real relationship with indigenous people. Reconciliation is about something entirely new, a decision and a choice to befriend and accompany our indigenous relatives on a journey of healing. If we choose to stop, if we choose to help, we are choosing a difficult path because of all the reasons that we didn't want to stop and help in the first place. Our fear of difference, our misguided education about indigenous communities, centuries of colonialism and white supremacy, the certainty that we actually don't know what's best that we don't have the tools. The most awkward part of this encounter and potentially the most life-giving is that we will need to rely on the woman, on her wisdom and the wisdom of her community to tell us what needs to happen next. We will need to listen intently and without ceasing to the voices like the woman in the ditch who will tell us the truth about what we have done wrong and what we might do right. As we engage in those deep and challenging conversations with indigenous people, we will need to cling tightly to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are animated by his death and resurrection and the knowledge that the creator can fashion something utterly new, a new relationship built not on a terrible history, but on the foundation of love and justice. Unlike the good Samaritan, In Jesus' parable, we will not sweep in like heroes. We are not prepared or equipped to tend wounds. Most of us are not skilled at triage. Instead, we will need to engage in slow, collaborative work. 
We will need to begin with ourselves to undo our misconceptions and our misrepresentations of Jesus that led to the subjugation of indigenous peoples in the first place. We as a church will need to tell the truth about what we did and did not do. One of the realities of being followers of Jesus is that we are called into a continual pattern of confession and forgiveness. This is not a once and for all, because there is too much to apologize for, there is too much history, there is too much wrongdoing. The good news is that we are forgiven and made free to engage in new relationships with one another. But first, we will tell the truth. We must tell the truth. A little bit later, we're going to share in a confession. This confession and apology was offered at the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Canada this, earlier this month. In 1994, the church made a confession to indigenous peoples but that confession did not include an apology. This new confession is a life-enhancing way to participate in reconciliation by saying we're sorry for those things that have degraded the lives of our neighbors. And we pray it as a church, not as individuals. We pray it because there are so many things to apologize for, and if there is any hope of forgiveness, it lies in our willingness to corporately confess our wrongdoing. We will need to cultivate compassion for communities that have not, after all, made this mess by themselves. Centuries of colonialism did that. And you and I were not there. We were not there when the worst of the atrocities took place. But under the banner of Jesus' love, we are all responsible. I don't believe for a second that any one of us confronted by an indigenous woman in the ditch would actually turn away. So why is it so easy for us to turn away from indigenous communities that suffer today? We have a choice. We can choose how this story will end. May God the Creator give us strength to tell the truth and the courage to hear it. Give us ears to listen and skills to tend wounds. May we be inspired by resilient and creative indigenous neighbors who despite everything have thrived in their own cultures. They have tremendous wisdom, but they cannot move forward under the weight of colonial trauma, which is portrayed, perpetrated daily in this country. May we choose life and health for all people. May we be good neighbors to all our relations. We are not alone. We do not do this work alone. We do it in the company of a savior and a God who accompany us on our own journey of healing. We do not do this alone. Amen.